This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at Clavio.com slash Spotify. That's K L A V I Y O.com slash Spotify. Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Deb Calvert about encouraging and supporting leadership at every level of the organization. Deb Calvert, welcome to the conversation today. John, thank you. I am delighted to be with you here today. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Kansas City area in Missouri. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today, uh, I'm just really excited to talk to you about encouraging and supporting leadership at every level of the organization. I am a firm believer that leadership is not just a title. It's not just a role within an organization, but it really can and should be embedded into everyone's mindset and how everyone approaches their work, regardless of whether you're that first entry level kind of position right out of you know high school or college, all the way up through the C-suite, through the executive levels. Uh, everyone needs to be a leader. And we as organizational leaders need to be developing leadership competencies and capabilities with, within all the people on our team, regardless of what level they might be at. Uh, so I'm just thrilled to have the chance to talk with you and to unpack this together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Deb's bio with everybody. Deb Calvert is president of People First Productivity Solutions and founder of People First Leadership Academy, is an ICF certified executive coach and certified master of the leadership challenge. Previously, Deb was an HR director with a Fortune 500 company. She works with clients to build organizational effectiveness by developing leaders, improving team cohesiveness, and strengthening soft skills. She has been recognized as one of the 65 most influential women in business by Treeline. What a wonderful background. Again, a pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? I just, I love this topic and I'm so glad that we're talking about it. Uh, let's see if we can blow some minds today because maybe people haven't thought about themselves <laughs> as leaders. Uh, I love blowing people's minds. That's like my favorite. So very good. So let's start with just the general kind of framing up of this, why leadership development and and what connections are there between leadership development and other positive outcomes like employee engagement, satisfaction, productivity, innovation? Yeah, well, first, why? Why leadership? Um, I, I don't know about you, John, but every day, it seems like things get harder than they used to be. And I believe that in this world today, everybody, every single person is craving clarity and maybe control and, and a sense of leadership, direction, that we're all looking for someone to, to guide us. And sometimes we need to be self-leaders and, and there's this mm -hmm. big void. So I believe this topic is, is more timely than it's ever been. And it, it will always be an important one. The links are huge. 
you could look at just about any research and it would tell you that there are positive benefits that come from developing leaders. But I'll, you mentioned employee engagement. I'll, I'll park on that for just a moment just to unpack this. Yeah, so employee engagement, when, when we say that term, what we're really talking about is a two-part. It's a cause and effect. Employee engagement is an emotional connection that an employee feels for their organization. And if, big word, if they feel that emotional connection, then they'll apply additional discretionary effort to the work that they do. All right, so what? It's great, sounds good in a survey. But when you have those two things, when you have an emotional connection, that means people stay longer. Mm -hmm. So you improve your retention. And when they stay longer and they care more, and now they're applying additional discretionary effort, by every conceivable metric, that means that productivity goes up. Mm -hmm. And customer satisfaction goes up because of the higher productivity and the happier employees. So then you've got top line revenue increases. You've got can better I, can bottom Can I zoom in profit. on that? Yeah, can yeah. I zoom in on that piece just really quick? The the customer satisfaction piece, customer satisfaction, cu customer loyalty. Lots of studies have shown that the more satisfied and engaged your employees are, the more satisfied and loyal your customers will be. And think about that for a moment. Why is that? Now, just imagine, like, don't imagine, I mean, reflect on your experiences in places that have been really great places to go as a customer and places that have not been so great. When you go to a place where you have bad customer interactions, where you just get really frustrated and you're like, I'm never going back there again. I'm going to go tell all of my friends and neighbors that that's the most horrible place. And I never want to go there and they shouldn't go there either. When those types of experiences happen, how happy, satisfied, and engaged do you think the employee is at that organization that caused that negative interaction? Usually they couldn't care less about the organization. <laughs> they're ticked off for whatever reason. They're they're maybe burnt out. They're frustrated. They're certainly not happy with what they're doing. And they take it out on the customer. And that has huge negative impacts on customer satisfaction, cu customer loyalty. So that's just one little piece of what you were just describing. But we've all, I think we've all experienced that. And it, it's really important to remember, like we need people to feel excited about the work that they do, especially customer facing people. They have to convey that passion for what they're doing and pass that along to the customer. Otherwise you're going to lose your best people in the organization, but you're also going to lose your best customers. Absolutely. 18 years ago, when I named my business People First Productivity Solutions, that's exactly what the kind of thing that I was thinking about. And then, you know, flash forward, employee experience equals customer experience. You can't unbundle mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. two. Yeah. We're on this beautiful domino effect, right? So we got productivity, customer loyalty and satisfaction. You get better top line revenue. No surprise. Yeah. You save expenses. So you get better profitability. And if you can get all that, this glorious cascade of benefits from employee engagement, it does, it begs the, the question, John, which is, all right, then just, you know, how do you, how do you do it? How do you get employee engagement? And it's a good question that's been looked at from all sorts of different angles. Demographically, who is the person? Culturally, mission-based, who is the organization? But none of those factors has nearly the impact as does leadership development. Leadership mm. development equals customer experience in, in double digit impacts uh, by every by every measure. So that's why I feel like employees deserve companies who will develop leaders and, and leaders at every level to give employees that that opportunity to to feel good about the work that they're doing and the companies they work for. Yeah. And now let's zoom in a little bit more on this idea of leaders at every level, because I mean, on the one hand, I'm thinking, you know, from a training and development lens, I'm thinking, well, you don't want to do leadership development with for everybody, because if it's expensive to do training and if people have no ambition and no desire to move into leadership roles or executive roles, why would I invest all this time and money into developing their leadership competencies? Maybe they're completely happy just kind of staying at a, a you know, a relatively mid-level uh, within the organization. They can clock in, clock out, go home, spend time with their families. They don't want ex all the extra hassle and headache. Maybe that's where they're at and they don't want all this other stuff. So why would I pour into them and invest in them leadership stuff that they're never, ever going to want to do? So that's like the the one um, the training and development or learning and development hat, you know, kind of the the uh, worst case scenario or devil's advocate position. How would you respond to that? I have to give three responses to to act, you know adequately cover the subject. And the first is, 
we have to unbundle what leadership really is. It's not management and it's not executives only. Leadership at every level is not a new concept and it's not some uh, fancy way of, of getting training to everybody in your organization. It's just an acknowledgement of reality. The, the yeah. truth is everybody leads. They already do. Whether you know it or not or like it or not, they do. <laughs> and if you don't help them to do it well, if you don't help them to be good guides, which is what leaders do as they guide, then they're going to take things a direction you might not want them to go. So this is about, first of all, having some cohesiveness around what leadership looks like in your organization. Not executive, not management. Those are different, just leadership. Uh, the second reason is, well, if you're not developing those people, regardless of what ascension they do or don't want to make up your org chart, they will probably be pretty dissatisfied and they'll probably be looking somewhere else for someone who will develop them. I've heard it said this way, John. So, oh no, what if we develop people and then they leave, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, of course, say, oh no, what if you don't develop people and they stay? You know, you're, yeah. you're limiting yeah. your organization. <laughs> developing the leaders that people report to, but also developing people at every level, that means that they get greater capacity for the work that you're asking them to do. They can be more autonomous. They're going to be developing confidence. Confidence leads to courage. Courage is the wellspring of innovation. There are, there are many different business cases that we can make here, but ultimately it boils down to if you want to unleash potential at an individual level and organization wide, then leadership at every level is the reason to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And this idea of leadership at every level, again, it refers to not just the formal title, the position in the hierarchy, managerial responsibilities. We're, we're talking broader about leadership and really more inclusively about leadership. You, for example, talked about self-leadership. Maybe hone in on that a little bit. So even if I don't have anyone reporting to me, I don't have any supervisory managerial responsibilities whatsoever, how could I still be a leader? And what? how would self-leadership um, fit within that context? Yeah. So um, one of the pioneers in leadership development, uh, Warren Bennis, he said that self-leadership is the first and most noble form of leadership. And I agree because I'm not probably going to follow someone who isn't a good self-leader, doesn't have the self-control and the confidence and the gravitas to inspire me. And so self-leadership is something that makes everybody more capable in their own day to day, to manage their emotions, to accept feedback, to continually grow and develop. And I guess I could frame it up like this to talk about what might not be as obvious as it should be, but if you've ever watched two three-year-olds playing next to each other on the playground, no formal education, let alone leadership right. development. And yeah. yet in any one of those moments, one of them is leading and they take turns and you know, leadership is for everybody and, and they watch and they get motivated by and they learn from and they play better together when they're having that kind of, of organic leadership that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of lessons we can um, gain from watching children and how they interact with each other. Uh, so I, I'm glad you brought that up. Now, you, you've also talked about the distinction between leadership and management skills. Let's hone in on that a little bit more. I'm sure everyone listening has heard about management is not leadership. Leadership is not management. Like these things are distinct. And there's lots of people who have talked about it, lots of articles on this. Yet, I think we, t we still over and over and over again tend to fall back on this old paradigm of leadership, equating it with management. Um there are there are some overlaps, but there are distinct skills, competencies, and capabilities of the two different realms. Uh, and frankly, in an ideal world, I want someone who's a great leader and a great manager. Uh, but it's not always the same thing, right? The, the same uh, skill sets. It's not. You know, the word "manage" comes from originally uh, the word uh, that was meant for hand in Spanish, "mano," right? Manage, mano, handle. And that's what managers do. They handle what needs to be done today. They handle that work through other people. They handle the assignments, the tasks, the KPIs, and so on. But the original root word of leadership was uh, laden, which meant to guide. Hmm. And that's what leaders do. They, they guide people, presumably then to places where those folks have never been before. Otherwise, why would they need a guide? Places where maybe it won't be easy to get to. 
and places where the person leading is, is going to be effective in clearing the path and helping people to, to get to that new place. So I believe that because of this confusion about what is a leader, is that just the executive ranks? What is a manager? Is every manager a leader? Do you have to be a manager before you can be a leader? Right? Without those distinctions, what we've ended up with is you're right, a lot of time and, and money is being spent, it's being wasted because there's an illusion that both have been covered and neither has been. Like I, yeah. I'll give you an example, John. Think about all those executive education programs, the ones with great big price tags at major universities. Or you could think about those one or two year long programs offered by chambers and the like. And th those are all great programs, but what they focus on are business acumen, networking, strategic thinking, decision-making, ethics, executive presence, change management, analytics, right? Sustainability, they, they focus on lots of, of topics that aren't about leadership development. Those are certainly beneficial topics for any leader to know, but none of those drive employee engagement. None of those position leaders to improve the employee experience or to shape the culture of the organization. So, Inside an organization, you do. You need basic supervisory skills for the science of managing, and you need true leadership behavior skills for driving employee engagement. And when you have that, you've covered the bases. Yeah, well said. Well, very good. So how do we start to to shift? You know, my experience has been in most organizations that you have well-meaning individuals who find themselves in these formal hierarchical managerial leadership roles. They don't really know much about leadership usually. Um, they're kind of just trying to build the plane while they're flying it and figure it out. And they usually default to what they've observed in the past. So if they've seen people do certain things, they'll just kind of replicate and do those same certain things. A lot of times it's actually not very effective. Sometimes it's even toxic, unhealthy behaviors. Um, so how do we start to disrupt this this world where most people don't really know what they're doing in terms of leadership. They're running around like chickens with their heads cut off, trying to just put out fires all day instead of actually doing leadership stuff. Um, and how do we, you know, because until we can do that, I don't think we can even really start to tackle this mindset shift uh, around helping everyone develop these leadership capacities. If, if the leader, the people who should be leaders themselves aren't actually leading um, because they just don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the time or the energy to even invest in it. Yeah, usually they just don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And so my recommendation is that you learn about behaviors that make leaders effective. Uh, there is an evidence-based framework. It's called the Five Practices of Exemplary Leadership. Over 6 million people have participated worldwide in 40 years of, of research about that. It's referenced in just about any leadership book that you'll probably ever pick up. It comes from Jim Cousis and Barry Posner. Uh, the, the book that, that they've written is called The Leadership Challenge, and that's also the, the mm -hmm. primary uh, branding around their, their workshops. But those 30 behaviors that are nested within all of that, every one of them has an impact on employee engagement. Every one of them is, is proven. Not, you're not just guessing or, or trying to start from scratch to craft something. And it fits very nicely in with any other construct that you might have for your leadership development, because this is the piece that's behavior-based. Simple, 30 easy behaviors that anyone could do more frequently and will become more effective when they do. So I, I don't think we you're after a commercial message there, but that's the one and only way I know that, that yeah. gets people to, to see leadership for what it is. It's, it's a set of choices and behaviors. Yeah. And from your own experience, both with that framework and your own work, you've worked with lots of clients doing lots of great work. What would, would be maybe those two or three things that you would suggest to anyone listening today if they want to start taking these first steps forward? Yeah, well, I'll give you a few of the behaviors as examples. I, I think one that is more important today than ever, given the state of the world, is a behavior that's super simple and it's not going to be a surprise to anyone, but you have to actually choose it. And that's to actively listen to diverse points of view. So not just letting the sound fall in your ears, not giving lip service to, okay, let's do a round robin so everybody has an opportunity to express their opinion, mm -hmm. but actively, as often as possible, mining for those diverse points of view and then genuinely considering them and, and bringing them into the, into the mix. I, I just think that's a solid starting place and probably no one is doing that as often as they'd really like to be. Yeah, good. 
and others? Yeah. So some of the other ones are super easy. Uh, the one that rates most high, and I'll tell you the one that rates most often low uh, in the assessment, the one that most often in my experience rates at the top of the 360 assessment that goes with this is that you treat others with dignity and respect. Yeah. Okay. No brainer, <laughs> but do it more often and do it very thoughtfully because that could mean different things to different people. So no people to do it well. Yeah, well, and that that does connect with the first one as well, right? Unless you're talking to people, getting uh, access to and exposure to diverse perspectives and really carefully listening, you're, you're not going to be in a position to treat people with dignity and respect. You're just not. And it really is that simple. Like the number of times I, I tell this to clients or, you know, people who are in training sessions or just students at the university that like you boil all of this down. You boil all of the leadership stuff, all of the organizational behavior stuff, all of the change stuff. You boil it all down to like some very simple things. One of the most simple foundational pieces is treat people with dignity and respect. <laughs> if you yeah. just like if, if we would all just treat people with dignity and respect, this world would be so much better. Organizations would run so much better uh, and would be so much more healthy. And all of the division and the polarization that we see in society it wouldn't magically go away, but you just listen to people and treat them with dignity, dignity and respect uh, and be a little bit compassionate towards their perspective. And my goodness, uh, so many of the challenges that we face would would not magically go away, but they bleed to the background a little bit and we'd be in a better position to address them in meaningful ways. So I love the two that you just mentioned. I think that is like perhaps the most important thing that anyone can do within their organization, within your own self-practice, within your, your working with your teams, listen hard, try to get diverse perspectives and not in performative ways, but actually paying attention and really taking into account what people are sharing with you. We've all been there. We've all been in those meetings where people ask for input and you know very well that they've already made their decision and they're just going through the motions to, to, so people can feel like they're being included. And, and you know that they're not actually taking into account your perspectives. That's frustrating. That's demotivating. That's actually not going to build any engagement. It's going to erode engagement and trust. Uh, and then treating people with dignity and respect at that foundational level, just recognizing, help, helping people recognize what your company, what your organization is all about, is about people. It's about treating people well. And we're going to disagree on things. We're going to ve vehemently disagree on things at times. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we're going to be at, at huge odds and butting heads with each other, but we're still going to be focused on treating each other with dignity and respect, recognizing that people have good reasons for the, their perspectives. Um, and it's built on experiences. It's built on their own unique background. And until we can listen hard and understand where they're coming from, you know, we're probably going to be missing out on some really important um, pieces that could help us perform better serve our clientele better, you know, bring more value to the marketplace. Well said, just, just like you said earlier, watch the three-year-olds on the playground, right? <laughs> they, they typically do more of that than sometimes we see in office places. So let me give you the bottom one. Uh, yeah. It's not nearly as easy as, as the first two. So uh, it is that the leader is asking for feedback about how his or her performance, his or her behaviors affect other people's performance. So it's a mm. two-parter. Asking for feedback is hard enough, but now asking for very narrow, specific feedback. I did this, John. How did that impact you? <laughs> it's a scary, scary promise, but highly effective. Yeah. No, it, it can be. People often don't like holding that mirror up in front of their face and looking, actually looking at and acknowledging what is is staring right back at them. Um, it can be really hard, especially if we know if we're if we're feeling a little vulnerable, we're feeling we, you know, maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome. We already recognize that, you know, we're we don't know what we're doing. And, and so we're really um, nervous about how we get the feedback. We want people to like us. We want people to see us as competent, et cetera. But leaning into a space where, you know, there's psychological safety, where everyone knows that they can can share uh, with each other what they're thinking um, and when we create that kind of an environment, it creates a much more robust uh, place for that feedback to happen so that we're not just sharing the niceties because we're worried about how people are going to respond. We're not just, you know, dealing in passive aggressive behaviors because we don't want to confront, confront things head on, right? Simple, right? Choices day to day and everything that you do, choosing more often to 
demonstrate these leadership behaviors makes you effective as a leader regardless of level and it doesn't have to cost a fortune for companies to do this that's a myth as well so yeah it's, it's and everything we just into. talked about those three areas i i suspect anyone listening would say yeah i would love for everyone in my organization to better further develop those three competency areas right and those skill sets so let's do it let's let's commit to it well deb it has been a real pleasure i know the time i need to let you go here in just a minute but before we wrap things up for today i wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you and find out more about your work your team and then give us the final word on the topic for today well thank you again john um my company is People First Productivity Solutions, the website People First PS. You'll find me, Deb Calvert, on LinkedIn, or you can go over to Amazon and get my brand new hot off the press latest book release. It's called Discover Questions for Connections, Clarity, and Control. And it's all about using questions to be more effective as a leader and in anything that you do. I'll give you this wrap-up thought on the topic. Uh, it's a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, a good leader causes others to be confident in the leader. Mm -hmm. A great leader causes others to be confident in themselves. Yeah, I love it. Leadership at every level. I love it. Deb, thank you so much for your insights, for sharing your time and experience with all of us. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Deb can do for you. Check out the new book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.